Thank you very much, um, and really a, a big thank you to, for the invitation to come and talk to you today. Um, so I was asked by uh, Jean to come and uh, give a talk, and she said, it needs to be hard-headed, and it needs to be evidence-based. So I'm not sure I'm going to be so hard, but I put the word evidence in my slide, so <laughs> I've, I've, I've sort of started with uh, how I mean to continue. Um, she also said, and I think this is true of any complex organisation, that uh, training can be seen as a, something you go off to, something you go and sit in a room, you listen to a talk, um, actually we've done research, you fall asleep after 20 minutes, and this is an hour-long session, so um, I'll have to remember to shout 20 minutes in. Uh, but actually, also, that there's this, this strange world of digital and de-learning. Uh, generally, um, what you'll get is an undercurrent. Everybody hates e-learning. The system's not good. It's, it's not built in. Uh, it, it can't work. Well, what I'm going to show, try and show you is some evidence that well, actually it can, it does. Um, the people who complain, our students complain as well. Um, um, one of the things I'll come to is I've, I've left a little bit of glossiness on each of de the desks, just to think to me, you know, yeah, glossy impresses, but actually getting people to do the job, getting people to be involved, that's what an online continuous involvement can really give you. So, uh, um, I'll, tr I'll try and get through this, and I'll try and stick with some evidence. Um, I've, asked, I've been asked to sort of leave some time for Q&A at the end, and I'll try and do that um, equally. I'm standing here in front of microphones, and I'm talking, so I'll, I'll try not... And I've got too many slides. Classic error. Um, so, to compensate for that... This is my last slide. First... So you've got another, you're going to come back to it after a very long time. Um, and uh, really just trying to get this across, that, my message. Um, there's various ways of doing this. In fact, I'd say there's only really three different diagrams you need in PowerPoint. And this is one of them. It's a circle. It's a cycle. Um, I'll, if asked, I'll tell you the others later. But uh, uh, and really, this is, this is my point, that you can think about how you're doing your job, how you're trying to encourage people to learn, in, very usefully in four different ways. Actually, there's various ways I could label this. Um, I have labeled it, you know, sort of, the, uh, essentially it's thinking about something, doing it, finding out whether it worked, and then making it better, um, a classic cycle. And actually, I found that these labels sort of design uh, an underappreciated aspect, the actual pause before you do things, really design. And I'd say that's one of our big changes over the last ooh, about 15 years, is really valuing turning that bit of our work into a process, a, a properly supported process. Then there's making it work, the support that we give, um, and how we do this, how, how we actually make it work, what, what the people in the system part is, as well as the technology. Uh, and then again, another bit that tends to get squashed, measuring whether things work. Uh, and actually the tools there, the digital tools that there are, makes quite a difference. And then do something about what you measure, make things better and go, keep going round. It doesn't stop. You can start anywhere in this loop. So, OK, now you can just think. You've heard it all. Uh, the rest is really just things I'm going to say about what we do in each of these spaces. And I suppose it's part of asking you to trust some of what I'm finding, what our finds are. I was asked, actually, by Jean to talk about our experience as a university, really. Rather, so I'm not going to talk about the particular bits of work we've done in the Centre of Policing and the particular things we've done there, which I know have been covered in other cases. It's really about our overall experience of trying to work at scale. So um, the OU, um, it's the UK's largest university, uh, largest university measured in terms of full-time equivalent students. And actually, our students aren't full-time, so in numbers, it's really quite huge. 
um, we've had uh, uh, roughly 150,000 students. Actually, if I was talking to you a few years ago, I'd have given you a bigger number. So part of the pressure of change that we are having to deal with is getting even more efficient as we have fewer students coming to us because of the changes in funding that were introduced uh, with the high fee system, which has been very discouraging to people in work, uh, much less discouraging to students who are coming out of school at 18. It's just a massive debt that they've got no idea how they'll pay off. Um, my son is one of those people who was one of the first people through on the high fees system. His strategy is to never get a decent job and uh, he won't have to pay it back. Um, I'm not that keen on that strategy, actually. Uh, but um, to people who are in work, it's very off-putting. So actually, that means we've had to be much more challenging to ourselves and sort of see how we change. Um, it's our 50th anniversary. Uh, uh, it was actually on uh, April the 23rd was the day when the OU was 50 years old. And during that time, we've done so many things. And we are a very complete university. We, we do space research. Uh, we launch spacecraft. Some of them succeed. Some of them don't succeed. One crashed on Mars a few years ago. And but on the other hand, one landed very successfully on a comet more, more, more recently. So um, we do a vast variety of things, but actually a very fundamental part of the OU is concern about students, about learning and teaching. And as I feel that from the intros just now, you're people who really care about the, how people learn, how they develop. And my part of the OU, the Institute of Educational Technology, uh, was established, in fact, I, uh, we just recently rediscovered the bit of paper that went through on the 24th of July 1969 that planned the formation of the Institute of Educational Technology and we were formed the following year. So we haven't quite worked out whether we're 50 this year or 50 next year. Um, but it, so obviously we weren't about computers and it's important to realise that actually thinking about the approach to teaching which is what educational technology is, is not just about computers. And so. Uh, some of the, the intro there, which is sort of is about the technology end, it's not just the technology. The technology is really how do you get it to work. Designing the approach can actually mean that um, our students get just as involving process whether the technology is core to it or just a periphery to it. And it's, it's actually, so don't get hung up on the technology thing. I'm going to show you some pre technology. But I'm not, it's not, it's never the core of the answer, it's really design. Um, so my bit at the university, just to finish that off, just sort of boast, and for the reason of sort of trust me a bit, we do a lot of research. Uh, we were actually ranked number two in the UK in the last research assessment exercise. We have the joy of every uh, six or seven years being assessed um, uh, through a... Uh, huge waste of time, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, nonetheless we did very well in it, we're number two, um, uh, if you want to know who's number one I will admit it's, it's uh, the Institute of Education which is a much bigger uh, focused in organisation, tends to do school based research, um, whereas we're doing a lot of adult based and technology research, so we've got a, a real claim to be very high in what we do. So I'm going to come back to uh, my circle, my cycle of, of things that you do, and look particularly at the first of these, uh, design. And as I say, this is perhaps one that I do want to get across, that places, uh, and we've worked with other organisations, and um, just don't do this. You just don't think of the design phase. Um, and how, how people will actually learn and the activities you're thinking through. Uh, you can get caught up in technology. That's, that's, I'm not meaning how the screen looks. We'll talk about that, but that's support. I'm meaning how do you actually get people to do what you want them to do? How do you get them to want to be where they are? The, the learning design. So it's actually des designed to help learners to learn. And I could stop there because I've made my point, is just think about it, but actually we've done more than that. We've actually built a whole approach to this, 
a whole approach to thinking about our uh, distance learning, particularly about our digital part of the distance learning as it's come in. So we've built a set of tools that help our academics, our academics work in teams, um, our university uh, builds a, a team that will work together each time we're doing anything that's student facing. And so there's a set of tools that actually help people break down what you're asking. So we're, we're producing quite complex things that last a long time that may or may not cross over, but actually the breakdown I know we've applied to other smaller entities by working with other organisations. So what do I mean by learning design? Well, it's a process. It's a process. We have tools that support it. We have outcomes that we use from it. But actually, it's a process. So we have learning designers. Um, uh, I think there was mentioned sort of the need for a whole new set of job skills as you go into this world. Well, this one didn't exist so much. The idea that you have someone who will help you design the learning experience in terms of what's involved. Um, and so we'll, we'll hold a workshop, we'll hold activities, we work through with people, uh, we get people to share their thoughts about what it is to do and, and make people understand what the impact of the thoughts you're having on the learners in the end. Um, and so we do that by visualising. So I'm going to talk about a particular tool we use as a more holistic process, but I think this gets across sort of some of the difference that we do. So if you break down what you're asking your learners to do, and you say, well, what is it that you're asking to do? Then, again, there's other ways of doing this, but we've come up with a seven different things that we tend to ask our learners to do. And so we have different things there. So this is actually a picture from one of our modules, one of our uh, pieces of learning. And it's how much of it is simulative, how much is basically read this, tell us what you think about it, that sort of approach. How much you're asking people to go out and actively search. How much you're asking people to communicate, produce things, experiential, uh, and interact with particular ways online. Or, often, or actually, I say online, but it can be very, it can be to go out into your garden and find the, and to count the snails. That's an interactive element. It doesn't have to be seen as something you're doing all the time, just sitting at your computer. And then there's the assessment. Arguably, and we did argue with ourselves, assessments, something that goes across the bottom, but actually breaking it down this way turned out to be much easier to communicate. And. So we do all sorts of different exercises to understand, break it down, come up with some numbers. Why do we come up with numbers? Because it enables us to feed back and understand. So we've done this for every single thing that the OU produces over the last 10 years. And that means that we now understand what is the intention in our learning in a way that very few places don't do. Um, otherwise, there's a tendency to produce something and you sort of look at each other and say ah that seems pretty good um, ah, give it to the learners they say ah that's okay not bad another thing ah also seemed quite good oh they're saying it's not quite so good how on earth do you actually improve from that point you just you've just produced stuff you haven't got no way of comparing it and this is not comparing it in subject terms but in terms of actual design for learning and so this has given us a fantastic tool with 600 different modules that we have running, all broken down, so we understand what was the intent. And actually, that was our first target, was to just build this process in. But out of that has come various things. So this is actually one looking at workload. So one of the things we realised is that we would be asking our students to do different amounts of work each week. And we can see what, so this, is, this has got rid of some of our detail now, it's just workload. It's not even into the different categories. And if you can see that graph in the middle, I, and I know the screen's not fantastically here, but, but basically you'll see a line that starts higher at one end and goes lower at the other end. That is basically us saying that as we ask our students to do more, they achieve less. 
now if you extrapolate, we'd ask them to do nothing and they'd achieve everything. So there's a bit of sort of <laughs> limits around this. So, um, but it does mean you've got to be really careful. And I think this is so, so often, uh, so I've done more direct evaluation working with module teams myself. And in one case, I just said, yes, this bit's good, this bit's good, this bit's good. Why are your students suffering? It's because if you were to close your eyes and cross out any of this course, it would be better. You're just getting them to do too much. Actually, there's a bit of a tough message behind that, because, and you get this coming back, that uh, uh, academics say, well, actually, we need people to do these things. So there's another even simpler message. Um, on the right-hand side, this shows variation in workload. If you change the scales um, and do variation in workload instead of just workload, you get exactly the same picture. So being consistent in what you ask people will produce better results. And that's really hard to argue with. Uh, there's no reason to suddenly say, let's try and cram everything into this week. And that, so that, um, I'll, I'll just sort of move on from this in a minute, but um, I just wanted to show this particular diagram which comes from a, a paper and to apologise some of, some of our picture, picture, my pictures are not that pretty because they, they're more about the data than about being pretty. Uh, this is just to show, well, it's no good doing this if people don't change. And the picture on, in blue there is a pattern from a particular module prior to going through this, this, this appreciation of what you're asking and the picture in orange. So basically this is showing a very common thing that far too much was just being give people stuff to read. And far too little is actually asking people to communicate, experience, uh, interact with things. It's so very common that out of this design process becomes a more interesting design. And I'll say later, when we come to the measure, why, why this is not just a feeling that this is probably better, but we can say from evidence, actually, the orange is better than the blue. And I'll come back to that, because it's, it's a more complex thing when I, when I say it later. So um, in this section, I'm going to talk about support. And this is actually, I've used this bit to, to, to put in some slides I've been given by our technology enhanced learning team. Um, uh, and Actually, I'm just as I say that, I'm realising I think they're now the te teach the technology learning experience team. So they've moved on in the, uh, it's, uh, with a more modern name. Um, uh, and so, so to show some of what we actually do and get across. Now, some of this you might think doesn't go directly across, um, and that might be true because I'm going to be talking about fairly big things produced for a fairly large number of students, and that might not be what you need. But the overall message of looking at uh, support and design, I think, replies. So the first thing is, um, part of what we do is still have humans in the loop. We are not trying for our students to take the human away. So we have associate lecturers. Uh, we have a mixture of face-to-face -face contact points and uh, um, online, but actually the big job an associate lecturer does is give feedback. And there's a national students uh, um, survey, and one of the things where we are right at the top is on our students' feedback on what they think of our feedback. And that's, that's almost counterintuitive, that the distance learning university is right at the top of students feeling that they get feedback. And it's because we've got people in the loop. So I'm now going to talk more about the things that we do overall. So this is uh, in the next couple of slides, just really again, sort of just to give indication of the sort of thing I'm talking about here, which I say may be a bit different to your context. Um, so we actually run things that are pretty big, um, typically, uh, six or nine month study, uh, but we divide our students in, and there may be 3,000 students studying simultaneously, 
uh, but we'll be dividing them up so they don't feel like that. They, they feel like they're point part of 1520. I've got to say, one of the classic answers is how big a group do you need? 15 to 20 is safe. <laughs> I'm not saying it's the only answer, because actually it'd be really interesting to try and push that up as we put in some, some more digital support tools around it. But that actually has been a pretty safe answer for us. And uh, overall, uh, we have uh, a learning environment that supports that. Uh, it has, it's very big, uh, 180,000 active users, um, uh, about a million transactions a day, um, and uh, six million quiz questions answered per year. So quite a lot goes on on this system. It is built on a system you may be aware of, which is Moodle, um, which is an open source system. Uh, but actually it is built on that, so uh, we've taken an open source system, a decision actually made um, now 13 years ago that we'd, we'd use an open source base for our, our course and that means we've been able to make a lot of changes and um, we invest a lot of money in this system. We don't treat open source as free, we choose open source as a good base. Uh, what do we do? Well, as evidence, we, we, we understand what works for our students, we understand what they need to do. Uh, we do a lot of academic and user research. So, uh, um, I'm going to mention a few times actually, um, I think I meant to check, I think today might be World Accessibility Awareness Day. And actually, one of our concerns is to make sure that everything will work for students who have accessibility disability issues. Um, we have, uh, and this is actually increasing, we have about 20,000 of our students declare a disability, which is a typical size of a university. So it, we have a whole university's worth of um, students who declare a disability. And that's increasing proportionally. Um, more people are, are openly admitting to having uh, d disabilities. Um, um, and also it's increasing the proportion of those who have some sort of mental health disability. So universal design, um, actually that's one of our challenges, we're working at scale. Universal design means making sure that everything will work for everybody, uh, which may mean offering alternatives for people who've got particular needs, rather than trying to make everything personalised, which is one of our challenges. Uh, said to a design, so this actually comes out of a study habit, habits research where we've worked, uh, actually a variety of different pieces of research being carried out, uh, bringing students in, having focus groups, <coughs> finding out what happens in the home. Um, we've carried out research which has involved giving people um, uh, recorders in the home so they can record exactly what they're doing. And it's built up sort of a range of things that we know we need to get right for our students. Um, in terms of the user experience. So this is, we've talked about learning design, this is more user experience driven. And to make sure that they can do the fundamentals of being a distance learner. So uh, this is a, a starting point for a student that might be studying. So we produce websites or into around what they want to study. And it's, it's making sure that they can get to what they need. They know what's happening. So we give our students flexibility, but it's flexibility within a constraint. So far, we've found that works for us, that one of the drivers is endpoints. The world is changing in that space, so we are exploring even greater flexibility in study. At the moment, we tend to try and keep people on track. So there's flexibility, and then you've got a synchronization point where you have to have done something by a certain time, or you need to join in with activities with others. And this is just showing how we sort of make sure that people know the details through timetabling each week. Okay. Um, so just sort of a few more parts. We, um, we have an approach which um, means that we produce all of our content in ways that can be transferred. So uh, this shows that we, if you wish, you could download your content Content isn't king, content is very important though. 
You can download your content in Word, in PDF, you can have it in a Kindle ebook, um, you can have it in other sorts of ebooks, you can have it in a way that's particularly accessible. And we do this by having a core version of our content that gets translated into these different ways, forms. And again, that's part of our addressing accessibility. Uh, we build uh, interactivity so that this is the bit where it be, um, where I wasn't brave and I'm feeling good about not being brave. I didn't try and link out to the internet to show any interactive things at this point, but uh, uh, I have got a, a demo site that can be used. But basically, um, uh, you can drag things, you can, do, you can uh, work within an interactive environment in lots of different ways. Um, as I mentioned accessibility, and I did want to make sure I included slides that showed that. So we have videos, uh, we, they play in a special player that we developed to make sure that uh, it's accessible to those who have difficulty, it involves captioning. Uh, we meet the, the legal requirements, but we more, more than that, we make sure that this is part of the core thinking that we're dealing with a very diverse space. And that can also include diversity in terms of the devices. So I've talked about the conversion, so we've designed our environment so uh, we can see how many people are coming in with a variety of devices now. And there has been a real move away from the classic desktop PC through laptops onto mobile. And uh, we've em embraced that. Uh, say we do this at scale, so we're doing this across a whole range of different subjects, uh, different module websites, and um, uh, these are just a few screenshotted together. Um, we do try and give people a consistency, but not actually give people exactly the same thing for every situation. Uh, and I just wanted to really come, make a little mention to the online synchronous element that's now come in more and more for us. So actually, so some research that uh, I've been involved in in the last year or so has been looking at the behaviors of our students. So we do do um, tutorials, the uh, classic educating reader type approach where we'll have um, academics or others who um, don't directly work for us apart from this, this job of being a tutor and get people together, very valuable. However, people are voting with their feet by not moving them. They are staying away. People are not attending our tutorials. Um, the actual habit of giving up a Saturday morning or a Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday evening, sorry, to come and uh, study, it, it, people just don't turn up. Um, so actually the move online is, is not just one that is being driven by any costs on our side. It's not. It's driven by what people are actually willing to do now. So we use, we, we, actually this is relatively recent for us, we switched to a commercial system, Adobe Connect. Uh, so we're a, a huge user of Adobe Connect. Uh, other commercial systems exist, but actually we've had quite a good partnership with Adobe. And um, uh, as I, just, I spoke about the online synchronous events. Actually, we encourage recording of those and we try to ensure, because actually we get a lot of similar events taking place because we've got so many happening. We try to ensure at least one of each similar event is being recorded. And the other change is more and more people watching the recordings. So, and you might think the recording is not good enough. It's a discussion. People watch them. People get things out of them. So you shouldn't decide beforehand that the recordings aren't valued. So that's a change um, for us. And it's a change driven by behaviors. Oh, I've got to say, actually, uh, you talked about millenni millennium people. What we found is age is not the thing. Um, so, um, uh, there's a, there was a lot of talk a few years ago about digital natives. It's turned out not to be that well based, the idea of digital natives. And there was some really interesting research done in um, Spain where they, they 
few years back, but they gave iPhones to elder, older people and found their behaviours changed. So actually technology interacts with the person as well as the person with the technology. So it's making available the right technology can drive those behaviours. Um, I, I have got kids the right age though, so they are different, but I'm just saying that actually if you let, try and pre-think what people do, it, it's not good to, to think that people on mass behave in particular ways. And uh, uh, there is an um, enth enthusiasm for books that are coming back in the younger generation as well. And, and, uh, I read Kindle, my daughter reads paper. So, uh, um, just sort of mentioning, we also produce some, some, so this is actually our open studio. So it, uh, you can think of this a bit, a bit like Flickr, but around academic activities. So people are asked to do things and share them. And sharing between our students is really important so that we get greater feel for people studying together. And that's a digital advantage for, for when you think about people working at a distance, trying to get together. OK, so um, uh, really just um, say a very basic bit, which we've been, now been doing um, since um, mid-80s, really, is use of electronic online forums, um, the actual exchange, text-based fundamentally, still really important. And w overall, oh, this is the trouble with borrowing people's slides. I didn't know I was going to do that. Um, so uh, this is the one fancy slide I've got. Um, so it's really sort of showing that actually we're now getting really positive feedback from what has been a um, instinctively negative uh, uh, reaction from students to the idea that we're going towards more online and, and e-learning. Um, for years, um, and it's still a bit true, if we actually write something and print it nice and glossy and give it, people will actually give us a big tick. So satisfaction driver, send people something glossy. Learning driver, get them to work with each other online. And that's where we come into this next bit, which is actually measuring and, you know, actually measuring what matters. And, uh, and realizing that once you start to measure what matters, you've got to work, so work, first work out that matters bit. Otherwise, you might measure what doesn't matter. Uh, you know, this, this is actually from my, my old car, because it does it nicely. Um, uh, I wasn't driving at the time. Um, so just sort of showing that what, what is the fuel consumption, uh, I, could, I could have that up, or I could have my speed. And actually, if you've got a display that's telling you all the time what you're consuming in terms of fuel, it just tends to drive your behavior better towards the economy rather than having one that shows your average speed it tends to drive you towards speed. OK, well, well, putting it in our context, and this is really important for us and a really important realization. Um, so uh, I've just put up uh, actually a MOOC certificate. I was trying to think, how do I represent success? The end point, actually, what are you going to get out of that? Or how happy are you? And we measure both of these. And so we have a sort of, are you happy? Are you succeeding? And the success measure is very objective. Um, the happiness tends to come back from the student. Uh, and traditionally, we've used um, survey-based approaches. Uh, part of our responsibility since 1969 has been to survey all of the students of the university. So we carry out massive surveys. It gives us a lot of important data. Our, what was called the university's KPI one, uh, key performance indicator one, was how satisfied are our students. Uh, but actually, we can now do measure much more of what people are actually doing. And it, it's revealed to us that it's quite dangerous. Happiness and success are not the same things, and uh, we need to realize this. So I've gone back to the learning design. So remember I was talking about this earlier. Um, learning design is sort of split out into those different patterns, but actually they, they do cluster. And so we came up with sort of after the fact different labels for four different types of modules. So I said we did 600 modules. We can say various different ones are constructivist learning design, which sounds quite good, but in a way that's, 
that's where you are asking people to, giving people stuff, asking them to do something with it. A more balanced, um, a, a socio-constructivist, that is, means, means actually working with other people, and an assessment approach, which is giving people the thing to do and getting them to do it, perhaps more flexibly. And what you find is actually at this end, uh, makes happy students. Giving people glossy things to read, whether they read them or not, makes them happy. Getting them to work with each other, peer learning, gets, leads to success. And actually, that's another success in terms of their outcome, success for, in terms of our outcome. They're more likely to come back if we've asked them to do difficult things they don't like. Uh, which, so this is quite challenging, because they're more likely to come to us if we give them easy things they do like. They're more likely to succeed and come back. But it's, it's actually realizing, and I think this goes down very well with people who are in the world of, of learning, that they, they, they like the idea that people actually have to work. I think everybody would tend to agree. But this is data. This is data telling us that feelings are right, that getting people to work together to do more uh, social things helps. Um, I'm not sure this, this translates as well, but it comes from academic terms. But, uh, just to get it right, students on assimilative constructivist modules are most satisfied. Students on communicative socio-constructivist modules are most engaged. That's actually measuring what are they actually doing, so they're more likely to be there and working. And this is really important for us. The, the happy students are the least likely to be retained and come back and study again. We give our students a lot of chance to escape from us, unlike most other universities. Um, uh, just this Bart Rient, he's the professor who led this research, and just to sort of say, learning design strongly influences behaviour. So actually, you can, you can do analysis that says how much does learning design explain something? How much does the fact you're a new student explain something? How much does the fact that you're on a particular subject explain something? It's learning design that wins over what, again, intuitive people might say it's more to do with subject. Okay, so I'm on the last of my cycle, and really I should be on the last of my slides, which isn't quite true. Oh, here's another of my diagrams, one, number two of the three that you need, a Venn diagram. So uh, this, is a, this is a classic one really about how do you improve the system and there's two big ways you can do it. Um, one is you can do something transformative, I think was the word uh, that was used earlier, or you can do something that's more incremental. Actually both really matter. And, um, um, I, and so this is, this is one of our staff development uh, tools, which is uh, uh, called the iceberg model, which is actually turning that work, the same research work really on learning design, into sets of advice, advice about how to make things integrated, collaborative, engaging, balanced, economical, reflective, and gradual, a contrived acronym if ever there was one. But actually it's, it's really hooks from our evidence through to what we'd advise people to do. So, and some of those I've really mentioned already, make things more, more collaborative, make things more engaged, uh, encourage, give space for reflection, because this goes along with the research on workload, give people space to do these things. Uh, but we also do the other side, the more blue skies thinking, um, transformative stuff and um, again actually I've, I brought a f I grabbed a few of these unfortunately not enough for one each but uh, they're spread around the room I think um, and it's all, it's all online but as I say glossy also helps it this has replaced my business card really um, and uh, so every year we write a report where we try to pretend not to be academics and we try to think of 10 things that are interesting that are happening where we could change the way we, we approach pedagogy. So there's a whole series now of 70 different things in that space. And we produced that originally to rival an established one, an uh, American one from an organization called EduCourse, um, uh, which focused on technology. This is focused on pedagogy. So we try to think, and there's, there can, we could, in amongst these, you could find something that really you want to try. 
Um, and I just wanted to sort of also pick out some of, of things that are on the edge. So this is from a research project. So we have our students um, writing essays or short pieces of written work. Um, and uh, they get, give them in, they get feedback, they get a mark. Um, that process works very well. However, what can we do to help the student before they give it in? So before they give in this essay. So uh, we've actually built a tool called Open Essayist and it does a variety of analysis. Uh, we worked in partnership with Oxford University. They did the uh, computer programming behind this. Um, and it'll break down, so give it any essay. So there's, it's no, there's no knowledge in this system of the ideal essay. It's, so it's not marking work against anything with the subject base. That will come from uh, giving it in. Instead, what it can do is work out whether you introduce a concept in the introduction that you never refer to again, or you come up with something in the, in the, in the conclusion where did that come from? And it, it may get this wrong, but it, on the whole it doesn't. And so it gives that message back. And uh, actually, Denise Whitelock, professor again in my unit, did this, this work. And visual feedback, so um, draw a picture. It draws a picture of how complex your essay is. So you've got, um, sorry, these may be a bit hard to see. I should have done bigger versions, but you've got a at the right hand side you've got a, 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 a complex well connected essay in your middle you've got quite a few concepts going through uh, nothing tends to be outlined this one actually this is a one which had that problem of somebody just in the conclusions talking about something that uh, wasn't there color coding means which different section concepts were introduced and we've brought, built a tool and some students will run this 25 times before they, they give in their essay. And uh, last thing I really want to mention in the area of sort of innovation and driving is being more open. So we've moved from only supporting our students to supporting open learners, uh, now in partnership with FutureLearn, um, uh, which runs MOOCs. But making things available for free, being open has made a huge difference to how we operate. Um, we have... Uh, uh, May, I think it's about 7 million people a year make use of our open content and open learn. And we tend to link this also with our other bit of openness, which is the BBC. Uh, uh, so the pro programs such as uh, Blue Planet 2, Frozen, Frozen Planet, those sort of things that have a high visibility, uh, but actually also link through to study questions as well and encourage study. Um, we've done uh, it's actually quite an old report, but it's, over the years we've done a lot of research on what it means to be open. And actually, a, a colleague, Martin Weller, who does leads this work, one thing he says is that open could be a very, very beneficial virus. That actually, once you start to close some of your security off, and this is a bit of a challenge in the police, then actually um, a lot of benefits can come. So it's, we, this report, for example, has a license on it that says, a Creative Commons license, anybody can reuse this. This means there is a Korean translation, uh, an Israeli trans uh, Hebrew translation, and a Chinese translation that we had very little to do with. We didn't pay for them to happen. We've just said, OK, you can do it. And just sort of last thing, just sort of bring it back to, we also do in our, our unit a little bit of uh, uh, master's level and so we encourage sort of a very open approach to that and we've now moved on so actually we are offering um, a degree uh, some, well, it's actually a postgraduate certificate that's sitting on FutureLearn that people can study part of it for free or engage through FutureLearn for, st for study um, with us. So I just really wanted to bring you back so I'm, I'm on my last slide I, you've seen this one before so really that's my message that for our context this really works I believe for your context it would help as well we're doing work with other complex organizations um, with uh, in the developing world in places like Myanmar um, uh, looking at the aid situation how can you help people to learn and share and Part of our message is going digital, 
going online helps us to help people to integrate this into what they do because all of our students are doing other things as well as being a student and digital has been a real enabler for us but actually it's getting the thinking behind it right that is even more important so thank you I suspect I'm closer to the end time than I should okay, be. Yeah. No, thank you very much for that. It was really, really um, fascinating. Um, we do have a little bit of time for Q&A, so if anybody has any questions, if you just put your hand up and we've got a roving mic. Your name as well, please. Yeah, it's uh, Dave Barber from the Police Federation. Um, it's not just because of will die, but obviously digital technology is, a, is an interesting concept. Um, and I get the, uh, the possibility for it to create capability, but not necessarily competence, which in a workplace training environment is, is also just as required. Um, so how do you build that into a digital platform to, to prove any sort of competency role, not just capability okay. role? Right, okay. I mean, in a sense, it's all about designing the whole experience. If you want comp competence and capabilities, you build it into the learning experience. I mean, you, you, you bit by saying, does the digital platform do that? Then you could be saying, does the blackboard do that you know it's 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 the overall experience so actually what some of our modules are like is very little of it is actual content you can see um, it's asking people to do things it's asking people to find things it's asking people to carry out the test of competence that you want so it's designing that but actually realizing uh, a digital environment is really good for this because it means that you can be doing this in those spaces in time. You can be doing it at scale. Uh, the openness can come into this as well because you might design a really good activity for a group that you're looking after. You might get them all together, tell them about it, ask them to do it, have another event, put this through an online environment. You might help that group you might help the people who couldn't turn up to it. You might help the other group in another part of your organization or even beyond your organization. So it's seeing digital as a tool to help you do what you want, not as something to fight against, and not just as a mode, not just as a platform. I think that's my answer. Um, and you can give paper out from time to time if you must. There's no paper these days that hasn't been through a digital process along the way. Okay. Hi, I'm really interested by the measurement conversation about how more likely to come to us if we give them something they like, i.e. the glossy, but more likely to stay with us if we give them something that's hard to do. Yeah. Is the takeaway from that, therefore, just give them hard things to do? Or is the takeaway from that, you need to run a dual approach, you need to draw them in with the glossy, shiny thing, come and start to learn? and then quickly take them into some quite challenging stuff. Yeah, as, as with any of these things, um, partly you emphasize the bit, the extreme that people are missing. So no, yes, you're quite right. It's a balanced approach that perhaps is needed. And um, uh, but it's, it's actually working out what you're designing things to do. So if you are starting, and we do do something a bit different with our first learners, the learners who are coming in uh, to start studying. If you're designing something to help people to study, to learn to learn, know that's what you're doing and getting people to the stage where they are then working together. So, um, uh, but actually I'd, I'd say the easy, in a sense I've taken a bit of an easy option today. I've given a talk and you're probably quite comfortable sitting in a chair well, finding your chairs are comfortable, I'm not sure. Um, but actually, if instead I'd done this as 
group work, which I think you're going to face soon, you're much more likely to get the point to understand a bit more about it. And it, it's the same thing online, that we need to build in those, those more challenging op, op, um, options. But no, I'm not advocating only do one thing. And it is, it is sort of valuing all seven elements that we have in our learning design pattern. So given that, you still measure both satisfaction and retention. As oh, yes. you say, more data is coming through about what people do, but you yes. are still doing your surveys to say what do people like. Absolutely. We, we, are, we are still doing, uh, so we're still measuring both. And actually, as a university, you've got no choice to measure, but to measure both. There is the National Student Survey, um, which uh, we, for years, were in the top five. We've slipped a bit. We're in the top 20. Uh, and... What I've got to say is the university is not comfortable about s slipping down a satisfaction table, even if we can say that's no longer the real top measure. Um, it is, we, want, we want happy, successful students, but actually challenging students can push that satisfaction down. But if you watch the retention and achievement go up, you've got to accept that you've, you've made a really valuable trade-off. And actually letting students know, letting students know that, that this matters. Um, one of our traditions has been that our students, amongst, amongst our students, we've got people who are sort of studying with us so they don't have to talk with, to anybody. And um, uh, we've got to say, well, actually, part of what's needed these days is to get those skills, is to do that, and you will learn better if we incorporate those sort of activities. Any more questions? I think we've got time for one last question. Hi, it's not fair, is it? A, a Somebody speaking asking a question of yourself. Um, of those modules that are described where um, learners were learning, were they the more traditional academic modules or were any of those about vocational learning? Because I think some of our nervousness is whether a student is happy or not in some of the learning that we need them to learn is, is an aspect. Yeah. But actually, our outcomes are that we have to produce police officers that are capable to deliver for the public. And so one of our measures is the public are satisfied that police officers are knowledgeable, they behave within the framework of the Code of Ethics, etc., etc. So I just wondered about some of the principles there. Are they about both vocational learning, learning to do a practical job, or more academic, if that makes sense. Okay, so the majority of our modules would fit an academic model, but actually we've got a sort of overlay, <coughs> overlaying of vocation in that our students predominantly are people who are in work. And we've now, you were talking about degree apprenticeships, we've strongly moved into that apprenticeship um, space with the same, looking at the same issues uh, we've also, as I said, said a little bit about, we've worked with other organisations um, uh, around the world, um, uh, including with actually Defence in the UK, um, but, um, with UNESCO, with others, looking at the design approach. And the same approach works. And what you've got happening is that you're working with intelligent people who will adjust some of those parameters. So I'm not saying that you do exactly what we would do for our students, but the overall approach and the valuing of the learning design phase I think makes a big difference. And actually what we've done is move more our academic study towards those aspects that would already be valued in a vocational <laughs> space. So I feel pretty secure, but I'm backed up with more data that comes from the academic and I'm not going to pretend otherwise. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much again. Thank, Thank you. you.